Recently, we've been fascinated by women's capacity for evil, especially by the sordid cases of Carla Homolka and Paul Bernardo, her husband and partner in deviance. But Carla Homolka wasn't the first. In fact, Alvin and Judith Neely were having a little spree, a decade before Carla and Bernardo started their well-documented spree of torture and murder. Both couples picked teenage victims, they worked together in abductions and sexual assaults. And when they found out, they turned on each other. There was a long and cruel trial and conviction for her murder. In reality, Judy was a poor, common girl from the Deep South, raised in a troubled home and incarcerated as a child. Her murder victim, 13-year-old Lisa Nemilikan, was the same. In June 1964, Judith Adams was born in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Her mother was a homemaker, and her father was a construction worker. The Adamas were neither poor nor rich, they were doing well. Her father drank casually but was never violent in the house. Judith had a close relationship with her father, who died when she was only nine. Intoxicated, he crashed his motorcycle into the highway guardrail and flew 100 feet into the air. Judith's father left them a little income and eight acres of land. Her mother worked at a local factory until she was arrested for sleeping with a boy. She then quit her job and stayed at home, so Judith had to take care of the house. At the time, Judith attended Walter Hill High School and was very hard on herself. In her eighth grade, she became a cheerleader after demonstrating her intelligence and strength. However, Judith had a very unstable household. Barbara used to allow strangers into the house. In fact, her mother's bed was only separated by a hung-up bed cover. She used to hear all her mother's drunken sexual exploits all the time. She attempts to escape by leaving the trailer and sleeping in one of the trees in the woods surrounding her home. At that time, Judith, 15 years old, met Alvin Neely, who was 26 and already married. As Alvin grew older, his pranks turned into crimes, almost always stealing cars. When he was 17, he and his mates were pulling a car to a dirt race track when the tow broke and the two cars slid off the road. A car ran into him as he checked the timing chain, shattering both his legs just below the knee on his right leg. Soon after, he was caught stealing a car again, this time as an adult, and sentenced to two years in prison. He was informed that if he behaved well, he would be released in a few months. He was released after a year and married Joanne Howard. Being a player, he found Judith's mother and was a regular visitor to the house. However, whenever he comes, Judith will dress up in much fancier clothes and continue to spend time without being asked. As they became closer, Alvin became more interested in Judith than her mother. He then told Judith that he was already married. But Judith told him their marriage would soon end because she liked him. And by that summer, she told him that she was a virgin, and she was certain that no one had ever been more in love than they were at the time. They decided to take a break as summer moved into fall. The pair initially resided with his family in Rome, Georgia, before moving to Kennesaw, Georgia. In July 1980, they made a brief detour to Ringgold, Georgia, to marry. Following their honeymoon, they relocated to Cleveland, Tennessee, to live with their parents. But they returned to Georgia when their money ran out. When they realized they needed money, they turned around, and Judith robbed a woman at gunpoint. They were apprehended, arrested, and charged with robbery. Alvin received a five-year prison sentence. She was transported to the wrong youth development institution because she was Jewish and gave birth to twins. During the separation, they could only communicate by writing letters, but they maintained their relationship. In November 1981, Judith was freed and took a bus to Cleveland, Tennessee to live with Alvin's parents and twins. She was shortly jailed again for robbing a gas station, released in March 1982. Judith was waiting for Alan at the bus station when he was freed in April 1982. The couple's first few weeks back together were pleasant, but the relationship quickly soured, in part due to their lack of cash. 
They only manage to get money by breaking into post office boxes and stealing the tax inside. When they returned to Rome, their money ran out, as it had done many times before. They eventually decided it was time for people to take them more seriously. On Saturday, September 11th, Judith once worked there with Ken Dooley, a youth development center employee. She was home by 10 in the evening when the phone rang. She answered, but received nothing but silence. She hung up, and while walking back, she found four gunshots at her front door. Luckily, she was not hurt, but the police couldn't go anywhere with the incident. The following day, another employee, Linda Adair's home, was firebombed with a Molotov cocktail. And this time Linda received a phone call following the attack by a female, who claimed to have been sexually abused at the Youth Development Center. But neither victim could identify the caller's voice. After the couple failed to do any serious damage, they landed in Macon and stayed in a low-cost motel. Then they began planning the murders of their former jailers, but they couldn't come up with a viable plan, and it appeared that nothing would work. Then, on the evening of September 29, 1982, Judith called several police stations in the afternoon, telling them exactly where she had dumped Lisa's body. But she hung up before the police could ask any further questions. Once an officer took the call seriously, a team was dispatched to the canyon to search for Lisa Ann Milliken's body. That night, lawmen from around the county used flashlights to find Lisa Milliken. She was found crumpled over a fallen tree. She was rescued by rope the next day. But she was already dead after investigators found three used syringes buried in her debris. They photographed everything, documented what they discovered, and then lifted Lisa's body from the canyon floor after collecting all of the necessary samples. They then continued their work, finding whatever evidence they could offer to support their probe. When police arrived at the Harps, people there appeared to dislike Lisa's appearance and openly stated that she was a boy flirt. When officers informed them that Lisa had been kidnapped and murdered, none of them seemed particularly concerned. They were unable to find any leads after speaking with all of the Lee's family and former associates, old foster parents, and even rivals. They even interviewed witnesses and had potential suspects take polygraph tests, but it was all for no good. The trail had gone cold after five days, and they had no leads. Then on October 3rd, John William Hancock and Janice Kate Chapman lived together for 18 months on Pike Street. They were returning from a visit with Janice's mother when John noticed some nuts and bolts on the ground and went to pick them up. When he got back up, he spotted Janice chatting to a woman inside a car with an out-of-state license plate that was too dusty. The woman explained to Janet that she was new in town, lonely, and looking for someone to ride around with and talk to. Janice, who had far too easily trusted people and had never lost her childlike innocence, seemed ecstatic at the prospect. John understood that she had been lonely and thought she would like to go. So he consented, and the two of them got in the car. He had Janice in the rear and, after helping her, climbed into the passenger seat himself. He had no idea Judith was communicating through the open two-way radio. In fact, Judith and Alvin's plan was to drive in separate cars and communicate via radio, using their handles instead of their names. John said over the radio that he was in a donut store a few miles away, which John knew to be bogus. The four of them went for a few drinks, but the liquor store was closed and their search for a bootlegger came up empty. When John needed to use the restroom, Judith agreed to accompany him. Marching John out of the car into the woods, he shot him in the back and left him for dead, driving away with Janice still in the back seat of the car. John was able to find the strength to get up. He returned to the rural highway and flagged down a truck driver. He was taken to Gordon County Medical Center, where the bullet was removed from the right side of his back. He'd been shot through the scapula in the shoulder. When he was interviewed by the police, they were first dubious of his narrative, as absurd and impossible as it looked. It wasn't long until Debbie Smith's mother brought her daughter into the same police station to report an attempted kidnapping. Debbie was going home from a bus stop when a woman drew up next to her and asked where she lived. Debbie said the woman followed pace with her, and they neared a place for abandoned children, from which she sped away. Debbie was interviewed by the police at the same time as John Hancock. Investigators played a tape recording of the police that they had received from the mysterious woman, informing them where Lisa and Milliken's body was located while he was delivering his account. John immediately recognized the voice as the lady who shot him. The next day, the police were driving John. When they went by car, 
Johnson looked precisely like the one the man was driving, but they could find no one in the car. On the same day, they received tapes of the woman who had been shocked at Kendall's house and had attempted to burn down Linda's garage. The officers determined that the woman who called about Lisa's body was also the one who shot John. The police then compiled a list of women in the development center and matched their descriptions to those provided by the victims. As each name was crossed off, only one remained, Judith. They recognized there were connections after analyzing her armed robbery conviction and gave her top priority. The ten photographs of Judith were frequently placed in a photo lineup, and each victim identified them as looking exactly like the woman or man involved in their crimes. Officers in Tennessee ended up arresting Judith Neely, but not for murder. She was detained at the motel on 10 September 1982 for passing bogus checks. Allen was detained on October 12 after visiting his wife in jail when officers suspected he was also involved in the fraud. Two days later, on October 14, Rome police were informed that Judith and Alvin Ailey were in arrest in Tennessee. They quickly drove to Tennessee and questioned both of them. Judith nationally denied her involvement in the murder of Lisa, but once they played the recording of the call, she said she felt bad for Lisa, and that she didn't want to go back to the youth development center. She attempted to cause Lisa pain by killing her, and when injecting her failed, she shot her. Alvin was the one who admitted that Judith and he had assaulted police officers before her murder. Alan was also the one who confessed to assaulting Janice Chapman. He also claimed that she was assaulted by a guard and her attorney while awaiting her older armed robbery trial. She was only 18 at the time of her arrest. On December 17, the judge announced the case status as a young offender and ordered that she be tried as an adult for the murder of Lisa and Milliken, with the intent to terrorize and violate. She pleaded not guilty and not guilty because of insanity, so the jury could find her innocent or not guilty. A trial date was set for March 1983, and a psychiatric evaluation was ordered. The findings were that Judith was in good contact and cooperative. No disease or diagnosis would excuse her illegal behavior. The trial lasted two weeks, and the jury reached a decision less than a day after hearing closing arguments. They found Judith guilty of murder and kidnapping on the 22nd of March 1983. The judge then sentenced her to death on April 19. Judith Neely became the youngest woman sentenced to death in the United States. She was on Alabama's death row at the Julia Tutwiler Prison for Women. Allen was still awaiting his trial in June when he pleaded guilty to murder and aggravated assault. And to avoid the death penalty, he was instead given a life sentence. Judith eventually pleaded guilty to Janice Chapman's murder. Allen, who was divorced at the time, remained incarcerated until his death in October 2005 from surgical complications. The sentence of Judith was commuted to life in prison on January 15, 1999, days away from her execution. But she was denied parole in 2018, and is still incarcerated. She was eventually labeled as the most dangerous type of killer after masterminding these objections and murders. She never expressed remorse for her crimes, and for that, she is still imprisoned.